Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew. And I'm Reverend Koshal Finch. All right. So we're on episode seven of True Words, a Shingon Buddhist podcast. Um, so the topic today is going to be the why of Buddhist practice. I think we've been talking for a while about uh, maybe discussing both from a practical standpoint and philosophical standpoint, um, what, why someone might practice Buddhism, um, what might bring them to the practice, and maybe from the standpoint of traditional practice or what the sutras say, what should be our motivation for practice. Mm-hmm. And I think it's about time to start talking about sort of the growth of the motivation and the purpose of practice um, within Buddhists. I think you're right. Um, so Buddhism has been culturally discussed in the United States for probably 60 or more years now and is a household word. Um, but I think a lot of times people come to Buddhism, especially in Western countries, um, from a different perspective than people would uh, in Asian countries or maybe if they're practicing in a traditional cultural environment. So it's probably good um, to discuss that topic a little bit and then also probably orient ourselves into uh, what the Buddha actually said should be our motivation on the path and uh, why that motivation is helpful. Yeah, because I think there are many different reasons um, in any given country for people practicing Buddhism. Um, So first off, I mean, you have, uh, and this is, perhaps a bit more prevalent in Asian countries, where the motivation for going to the temple, attending services, um, making offerings, is to um, gain good karma and um, to sort of hope for a better rebirth or a better future. Yeah, I see this, uh, well, I have to admit, when I first went to Asia, I expected it, the uh, cultural presentation of Buddhism to be exactly how I read about Buddhism in philosophical texts, as, as if everyone would be sitting around in meditation and it would be the silent space. And instead, um, it was, I think, much more, what, what I guess I could say, a cultural presentation of people offering incense, bringing offerings, and, you know, with a very specific motivation of, you know, I want my life to be better, I want good luck, or good fortune. Um, and initially, I, I think that from, from coming from the West, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, but then later, I realized this is just like any religion, um, any spiritual practice. People come to it out of their most immediate need um, or what's happening to them at, on that day. And mm-hmm. when they spend time in it, then they usually develop uh, a deeper uh, philosophical motivations or have a deeper understanding of the, the path of practice. Um, so I see this a lot in scholarly works sometimes. Um, I'll read something like along the lines of the particular scholar went to this temple and asked the monk, you know, why do you do this? And didn't get um, what in their mind is a satisfactory answer. So they conclude no one understands why why they do this practice or um, or Buddhist, Buddhist practice is all superstition. Um, so I think that is not quite the right uh, perspective. Um, But in, I guess, a traditional sense, you see a lot of different motivations for people coming to the temple, not just, uh, I want to be a a great meditator or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's very interesting how sort of these practices evolve. For example, I know in Singapore, there's a temple that does an annual student blessing um, right Mm -hmm. before finals week. (laughs) Yeah, and I, you know, and in Japan, a lot of the Japanese temples, uh, if you go, you'll see uh, omomori or talismans. And there's mm-hmm. probably, um, as cultures change, you know, there's some for playing baseball or soccer for kids. There's some for study, love, matchmaking. Um, probably a lot of motivations that people who came to Buddhism through um, scholarly sources or reading would be maybe surprised to see. Mm-hmm. Um when we were thinking about this topic, I thought, well, actually, it's not much different than, let's say, someone going to university. Um, when I went to university, uh, I didn't give any thought at all to what job I might have when I got out. I was just very motivated to study and learn more. Um, other people I met were very focused on career. 
and what they would do mm-hmm. afterwards. Okay. And other people were there just for sports or, you know, I had a lot of uh, classmates that were not interested in anything other than partying and socializing. So okay. I don't think that that diminishes the benefit of the university or what the university is there for. But I don't think at the same time we can either look down on any particular motivation as being this one, it has to be this way, or, you know, those other motivations aren't welcome. I think at least in the Buddhist perspective, all of those motivations are welcome. Um, gotcha. And perhaps even even needed. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I know traditionally how it's explained is that from this initial motivation, it goes on to talk about um, motivation for liberation, uh, self-liberation mm-hmm. and renunciation as well. And I think that might be something that's um, a bit more prevalent in the United States, it's definitely um, seen a lot uh, in the Buddhist circles that I hang around in. I would agree. I think, um, especially in more traditional um, presentations of Buddhism, so what I guess we would call in the West, you know, ethnic Buddhism, um, which of course we're both um, practitioners in, um, that specific motivation is more overtly stated. I think in maybe more American, Western, uh, created or organized uh, temples or meditation centers, that may come as a surprise. I don't think a lot of people walk in the door saying, um, I'm here to end birth and death. That's not their, <laughs> that's not their first <laughs> uh, uh, thought when they walk in. It's something that they uh, come to learn about within the path. Um, but at least from my perspective, I think what the beautiful thing about the Buddhist path is it, it leads you there uh, step by step mm-hmm. in a very skillful way. It doesn't yeah. have to expect that you necessarily have that motivation uh, on day one. So I think um, the initial motive, or not necessarily the initial motivation, but the first level of motivation um, being um, improvement, I think that's present in any Buddhist place. Um Asian countries have their way of showing it, but I think in the United States it shows up as trying to be um, improve the present. For example, improving um, their life to relieve stress or um, to improve productivity, productivity, happiness, and all these things that meditation and Buddhist practice seems to have been associated with in these last few years. I would agree. I think um, well, so. This is the United States, and uh, everything is about marketing. So I think Buddhism has been heavily marketed towards um, a lifestyle of stress reduction, um, having more control over your mind in order for you to be more um, productive and more successful. And I think that's probably a very different motivation than what you would see in the East. But I do think it grows out of the needs of people. Our lives are more hectic. We have more devices. We have more distractions. And um, I think there's sort of a desperate search for uh, an escape from uh, all of these things competing for our attention and our inability to really get control over our thoughts. Yeah. Um, So if we go past renunciation, I think the last one that is typically mentioned is um, the motivation to liberate all sentient beings which is a very vast motivation. It is. So this is in Mahayana Buddhism, you know, what we would call the Bodhisattva vow. Um, and I, I thought about this. I thought, well, actually, um, some of these ideas are also present in Christianity. So probably a lot of our listeners will be familiar um, with that. Uh, if we look at you know kindness to the stranger, welcoming people that um, we don't know, or... Uh, maybe even the story of the Good Samaritan, something along those lines, that we, as we develop in a spiritual path, we grow beyond our personal um, individual needs, and we start to see that other people have uh, needs as well. So this same idea is present in Buddhism as um, the Bodhisattva about that our motivation really should be to um, develop ourselves so that we can actually help others. I think at the beginning, though, that's a pretty big, It's a big step. That's a a really large, um, that's a vast idea. And I've actually heard from a lot of people that um, 
to even thinking about it sort of uh, stresses them out or exhausts them to consider it. Um, but I think traditionally, you know, the Buddhist teachings are quite clear that without that motivation, uh, we're not going to liberate ourselves. At, and so we, it has to be something that we take on. Yeah. And I think part of the explanation for um, the Bodhisattva vow and this really big motivation is that um, ultimately all beings are interconnected. Um, and to liberate others, we have to liberate ourselves. And to liberate ourselves, we have to liberate others. That's true. Um, when I was younger, so I grew up in a bad neighborhood. Um, <laughs> so when I was younger, I remember... Uh, you know, oftentimes you know, there was crime and it was quite prevalent and then, you know, something you owned would be stolen or your house would be broken into or something along these lines. And I recall um, <clears throat> being young and thinking I would prefer that this not happen and then prefer that it not happen again. So I was very focused on, I don't want my things stolen or my house broken into. And then the state government at that time had, uh, very suddenly cut a lot of social benefits. And I recall it was over you know, the course of a weekend, people felt very desperate. And there was a huge spike in crime uh, that summer because of this feeling of desperation um, and need. And it became quite evident to me that um, you know, the only way that I was going to feel secure, the only way that I was going to get uh, in a very mundane sense what I wanted, which was to not have my things stolen, was if everybody felt secure. And so that, that teaching of interdependence is, I think, um, something we can see quite clearly within Buddhism. A lot of things that um, we experience in the world that you'll see on the news these days uh, have a lot to do with other people's insecurity, people fleeing from strife or war, and then the effect that that has on others. So um, this Buddhist teaching of interdependence shows us that it, uh, you know, it's not something that we can do alone. We have to ensure that other people are taken care of as well. And that's the only way we're going to um, kind of find the goal that we might be seeking. Yeah, definitely. Um, does Shingon have its own perspective on this? It might not. I'm not sure, actually. Is it unique in comparison to the general Mahayana view of this vow, or how does it go? Well, I think um, Shingon probably, as a as an esoteric, or you might say in a modern sense, tantric school, tends to look at this maybe a little bit more broadly than the, um, the, the traditional Mahayana view, meaning that... Um, we have to develop kind of an acceptance of all things. And part of that uh, acceptance or understanding of interdependence is seeing ourselves as not separate from anything and not making distinctions between things. And that's a very difficult uh, viewpoint. Um, it's a difficult viewpoint to um, see ourselves as connected to or having any responsibility for, let's say, a criminal um, so I think if you go a little bit further in the um, tantric view, we'd say, well, perhaps, um, you know, as a member of society, we have to have a, a broader understanding of the experience of this individual and what uh, what influences led them to these choices uh, and not sort of cutting ourselves off even from someone who does things that we would condemn or we would turn away from. Um, and maybe even in a greater sense, uh, a lot of times people enter the spiritual life and think that it's everything should be about purity or everything should be about, um, you know, turning away from things that may be distractions or uh, hindrances. And I think at a deeper level, Shingon teaching would tell us that um, the idea of purity, the idea of a hindrance is also just a mental obstacle. So, um, well, I guess a great example we have is uh, in the monastery, we have a particular uh, deity that's enshrined in the bathroom. And um, when I first started the practice, I thought, oh, okay, it should remind me to keep the bathroom clean. 
this is a place that has to be clean. <laughs> and later my teacher said, well, actually it's the opposite is people think the bathroom is a place where, you know, you get rid of dirt. Uh, but actually the teaching is you should see the proper functioning of everything you do in the bathroom. as not different than the proper functioning of everything you do in the kitchen. You have to see these things as, as, um, you know, it's the same as both of them as pure that if, uh, if the plumbing is backed up in the bathroom, you'll be very uncomfortable. Um, and if the plumbing is backed up in the kitchen, you'll be equally uncomfortable. So we don't see a, a distinction, but we often, um, you know, see something that's foul smelling or putrid or something like this. And we want to turn away from it. And um, we have to see that we're connected to it. Um, if you want to take an environmentalist view, well, I used to have a uh, compost heap. And, uh, return it and tend to it very, you know, very diligently. And we'll see the earthworms come and they see your food scraps and vegetable cuttings, uh, first very, very, uh, obvious. So that's a carrot, that's celery, that's cabbage. Over time, it starts to come apart and, you know, not so good smelling. And then eventually you have this, you know, really beautiful soil. So to start seeing things as a cycle of transformation rather than you know, these strict, uh, separations of, purity and impurity. So I think that's something, especially in Chingwon, that's perhaps more overtly stated or stressed at points in training um, than perhaps you would see in a lot of other Mahayana practice. Not to say that it's not there, uh, it's just where the stress is laid. Gotcha. Okay. So it seems like this is talking kind of about a lot of potential, and does that go back to the idea of Buddha nature as well? I think it does. Um, you know, so our, our basic concept in Buddhism is that, um, you know, we all have this potential for enlightenment and it's present in all sentient beings. So from the amoeba up to the human being up to, oh, I don't know, the little, the Martian, whatever. <laughs> um, and because of that, uh, we're all connected. We're all connected by that potential. So we have compassion for other beings and we see ourselves as connected to, to other beings. We don't, um, see a distinction or see that, um, humanity is somehow more important than, you know, birds or fish or anything of that nature. So when we start to really open up that view, then we can see our practice as connected to uh, other forms of life. So this is, I think, another aspect of uh, the Bodhisattva vow. You know, how is it that we can develop this compassion, uh, this intention to help other living beings? It's because we actually share something with them. So then um, we don't see such a strong distinction, a separation. It's really in the separating that uh, we get ourselves into trouble, where we start to create conflict and uh, uh, strife. This is, a, this is a very key idea, you know, what we see a lot right now in the, in the world is uh, nationalistic movements. Everyone wants to put uh, themselves first or their country first or their people first, rather than seeing commonalities, rather than looking at uh, how we can help each other. Yeah. Because they somehow aren't seeing that helping each other is actually helping themselves. It's, it takes a very, very narrow view. So <clears throat> going with that, um, how does sort of this bodhisattva vow show itself in the practice? Mm. Well, I would say first that um, the thing that you see less often um, in, or what appears to be less often seen in Buddhist practice, especially in the West, are um, giving or um, you know, helping the poor or direct outreach to society. Um, some of that there's social and, and political reasons for, um, you know, immigrants who brought Buddhism in. There's a reason why they didn't do a lot uh, publicly. But I think a lot of times people expect um, you know, Buddhist practice to uh, be more overtly involved in uh, people's lives or giving away food at Thanksgiving or something along these lines. Um, so I think that's one area where, at least in the West, uh, we need to be more visible. It happens, but it tends to happen um, quietly in a way that people don't think it's it's happening. 
But where I think you see the Bodhisattva vow uh, probably most prevalent is teaching people where they are actually creating harm, where they are probably not aware of it. What we are doing a lot of times in Buddhist practice and in meditation is developing a, a more keen awareness. We're becoming more sensitive to things around us um, and starting to understand what we might say uh, in more modern psychological uh, language, microaggressions, uh, ways that we rub people the wrong way, the way we, uh, words that we choose that may be uh, harmful, that we can tell ourselves, oh no, I didn't mean anything by that. But in fact, uh, we knew that, you know, that word choice would be hurtful to other people. And through that, how we're very slowly uh, transforming our environment around us, the friendship environment, family environment, work environment. So I think um, a lot of Buddhist practice has this transformational um, nature in our daily lives in this way. When you begin to see, um, in fact, how we've been behaving and how uh, we affect others, and then slowly transforming that. And um, when I talk to people, after a few months, they realize, oh, actually, things for me have gotten a lot better because I'm more aware of what I say, how I say it, how I conduct myself. Um, and that may not seem like the path to world peace, but I think um, actually it's it's probably the most effective um, result of our spiritual practice in Buddhism. Hmm. Okay. That actually kind of ties back to what I learned when I was... Um, still studying psychology. Uh, in social psychology, I don't remember what the experiment was called, but there was a study on um, the degrees of influence that humans have on each other. And they found that humans have three degrees of influence. So for example, if I were to have elevated mood um, or any change in mood, that change could be seen in not just me, but my friends and friends of friends. And I think even one level past that as well. So it's really none of us live in a vacuum and anything that we change about ourselves will start changing the environment and the people that we interact with. Oh, I would definitely agree. Um, if you have a bad day, you know, something happens uh, on the way to work or school. The first thing people do is, you know, share that story with uh, friends and, um, you know, people care about you. They, they take an interest in that. And that, um, experience depending on how, how emotionally um, impactful it was can have a corresponding effect on the listener and then maybe when they retell that story you get home you know oh, so and so told me the story today and the other person, oh gosh that's horrible and a lot of people it, it becomes to really bother them and it wears them down and here's another thing you probably hear in um, psychology psychology circles would be compassion fatigue at some point people get worn out um, they feel like they can't keep your no stories any longer. Um, but if you, I think through practice, um, what people find is maybe that initial trigger doesn't have the same effect on them uh, any longer. Um, so someone cuts you off in traffic or uh, comes in front of you in line or is very rude. And um, instead of it really uh, throwing you off, you just note that, oh, well, perhaps they're in a rush. Um, that's fine. They can go ahead. Or, oh, I, I thankfully, I, I escaped uh, a potential accident. And that's your perspective rather than, you know, how dare they do that to me? Um, don't they know who I am? Or <laughs> a, a different perspective. Um, so through the benefit of your, of your practice, you can eventually, you know, bring that perspective into the lives of others. So you actually can benefit others through your practice and completely change an environment. Um, if you hear people who grew up with an alcoholic or someone who was abusive in their family, you know, eventually just them coming home or getting to the time when they, a person may come home raises the tension in the house, um, would raise the stress level of, of children. Um, and sometimes they would say, you know, when that person went away or when they went into uh, you know, rehab, you know, we all felt better. So we do have this uh, effect on the people around us. So if we can learn to lessen that, 
you know, if everybody meditated just a little bit or if everyone did a little bit of practice, I think uh, this overall stress in the world would be a lot less and tension and, you know, people would be able to find resolutions to problems uh, more easily. And I think it becomes a cycle, too, because as we change the environment to become a much more supportive and compassionate society, we're making um, the external difficulties and afflictions less as well. That's true. If you look at uh, countries who've put a lot of resources into people's basic needs, who've recognized that um, uh, the part of what the goal of society is, is to take care of each other. You see social problems are fewer, crime is less, um, you know, a lot of the things that grab our headlines these days are not such a problem in those areas. Um, but where we, you know, draw strict distinctions and point fingers and point out the differences between each other, uh, those issues become uh, greater and greater. So I think you could really definitely base uh, a great deal of social change and see a shift if, um, you know, people work together. You, you can see that in the world, um, you know, after World War II, I think there was an effort to, especially in Europe, try to start seeing each other as Europeans, um, which led to the European Union. Um, well, let's look at our similarities rather than our differences. And um, you, know, you haven't had a, a continental-wide war since that point. So there's some benefits there. Um, so I think it, it is something that can be done. Um, and I think if people have that in mind, when they come to the Buddhist path, uh, their practice will be deeper and richer rather um, than only uh, thinking about, well, I just want a stress relief or, um, you know, how can I do better at test taking or how can I be more effective in my career? Hmm. Okay. So um, going back to what you said about seeing more similarities than differences, um, I understand the difference in viewpoint um, that we should be looking more at similarities but how do you think we should address the very obvious differences that we do have? I mean, everybody is an individual to some degree, and even though we're part of this greater collective, there are definitely still many nuanced points between each and every one of us that keeps us separate as well. Well, I agree. Uh, I think the, the key would be uh, we need to point out and celebrate rather than... Uh, point out for the purpose of dividing um, or for ordering one is more important than the other. So um, it, Buddhist teaching, especially if you read the sutras, it talks a lot about not seeing distinctions. So I, I see that on one hand and I, I understand it, um, you know, when I'm on the meditation cushion or, you know, doing practice. And then I leave that and I notice that uh, every Buddhist temple of every tradition, especially in Asia, has a very strong uh, cultural presence and celebrates the culture um, probably more than any other institution. If you go to a Buddhist temple, um, really they're part museum. You see a lot of cultural perspectives, art, poetry, literature on display. Uh, so I realized, well, at the same time, you can see the differences and celebrate them, but that not be an obstacle to practice. And I think... Um, you even see this in the Buddha Sutras. The, the Buddha points out certain uh, students and, um, you know, says, you know, they have this particular merit, virtue, uh, these attributes, and that's something that, uh, that we should applaud them for. So I think the proper way is, um, you know, to see those distinctions and, and celebrate it. You know, let's say we have here in the United States, you know, a vast um, number of people, immigrant groups, people from all different backgrounds. Um, but instead of pointing out to divide and saying, well, you know, those people don't conduct themselves as Americans, we go out and learn about their culture and, you know, celebrate with them. Oh, you know, this people have a festival and they do this and let's go and celebrate with them or learn about that. Um, I think that's probably the proper way. But again, we go back to practice and see how our, our words actually uh, operate to harm or heal 
uh, I think a lot can come out of that. Uh, you know, looking at our motivations for the words we use, the words we choose not to use, uh, it can actually be something that that helps us rather than puts up obstacles. Awesome. Okay. So it seems like we're almost out of time for today's talk. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Mm, I think when you brought up um, the interdependence as an idea in Buddhism, I think that's something that um, we have to keep in mind. I think in the West, um, a lot of Buddhist centers tend to align themselves with one particular uh, political viewpoint. And I would say that, um, you know, our practice needs to be open, uh, both literally, you know, open doors to all backgrounds and political viewpoints, but also um, mentally keeping in mind uh, an openness towards all viewpoints. People that we disagree with um, are something that we need to invite into our practice, that we need to uh, learn more about and uh, find compassion for because we're not separate from them they're they're not separate from our world or our, our reality so um, we can't exclude them from our practice or our conversation we have to uh, invite them in so i think that would be um, just as as the world is today uh, something that we should keep in mind that's some very difficult homework that you're assigning us <laughs> <laughs> it is hard and uh, it is hard uh, for all of us, but it's, it's something that we have to, to keep in mind. I think um, we have a lot of things to think about in that realm uh, today. Uh, people listen to this podcast and then um, you know, turn the radio on. They're going to hear something that probably distresses them. So um, it's something that we have to keep in mind is not seeing our practice separate from the world. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.